Hello, everyone. Welcome in. We'll get started in a few minutes. We know we have a very international audience joining us today, so feel free to share your location in the chat. Say hello. Welcome, Laura Sarah. I've heard of her. Welcome from Oakland, someone from Iceland, Montreal, Australia. Fantastic. Slovenia. Hello from Baltimore and Dessau. That's interesting. <laughs> this is fantastic. Yeah, Mexico, Istanbul. One of the exciting things about this event is that we're combining audiences between Cooper Hewitt and Letter from Archive. So uh, it's really cool to see folks coming from both of those communities. We'll get started in about three minutes. David Cabianca, welcome. Good to see some familiar names here. And we already have a question, but that's just Mike saying hello from San Luis Obispo. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of the things I always like to remind people is if you'd like to um, chat with everyone and change the uh, little menu bar in your chat uh, to share with everyone. Otherwise, you're sharing just with your with the host and panelists. And um, yeah, we'll get started here in just a moment. Welcome from New Jersey and welcome from Poland. Louise, welcome from Ojai. Well, I'll quickly introduce myself and, and get us started here in a moment. My name is Stephen Coles. I'm the Associate Curator and Editorial Director at Letterform Archive. Uh, and we're really excited to have this partnership with uh, Cooper Hewitt and uh, to uh, have a, a, a conversation, a, a presentation from Ellen Lupton, who we all admire so much, uh, has been a really integral part of this show, wrote a great introduction to the catalog of um, our exhibition. And so we're really excited about this uh, event and to share some time with her. Before uh, we welcome Ellen to the virtual stage, um, I'd like to talk about a couple of things that are coming up uh, at Letterform Archive. We have uh, our next salon series uh, with Islam Ali, who is one of our favorite makers in the collection, does incredible things with artist books and uh, laser cutting and Arabic uh, type. Uh, and he'll be uh, joining us to talk about Arabic letter forms and contemporary book art. Um, we also have a workshop coming up with Hope Meng. This is a Back by popular demand workshop uh, called Modern Monograms. Uh, and you'll spend four Wednesdays uh, finding and exploiting the relationships between letters. Hope is a great teacher and a great designer, so that should be a good one. 
Uh, and then we have a themes tour. If you've ever been in the online archive, uh, uh, and if you haven't, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, but uh, you'll have a chance to spend some time with Rebecca and Naya to um, look at the influence of the arts and crafts and Art Nouveau movements on typography. Uh, and she'll guide you through these, these movements and, um, and give a, a lecture and kind of a tour uh, through the collection. And then we have a really interesting online workshop coming up with Rudiger Schlimmer, who wrote this incredible book, uh, Typographic Knitting. Um, and this uh, is going to be a uh, multi-day workshop where you'll uh, spend your time uh, learning knitting skills and um, combining that with typography. You can make a poster, scarf, pullover, blanket. Um, and uh, if, if you've ever seen his book, uh, you'll really enjoy this one because it'd be fun to put uh, some of that stuff that he shows in the book into practice. And then finally, uh, we have, uh, well, if you'd like to learn more about the events that we have coming up at the archive, go check out that URL. And we have Menesha here uh, sharing links in the chat as well, if you want to direct click to the site to learn more. We also have uh, volunteer opportunities. It's been a while since we had volunteers coming to the archive and we're excited to uh, call all type lovers to volunteer as attendants at our gallery. Um, the same gallery that you'll be hearing some about from Ellen today. Um, so we'll, we'll need some help in supporting uh, the gallery and shop operations and ensure that all of our guests have a fulfilling experience. So uh, this will be in real life at the archive shop and gallery, and uh, you will be given a standard level membership during the course of volunteering with us. So uh, check that out uh, in the link that was just posted in the chat. So I'm uh, really excited to welcome Ellen Lupton to this uh, event. Um, she is a writer, curator, educator, designer, uh, she is the Betty Cook and William O. Stein Metz Design Chair at MICA in Baltimore. She serves as Senior Curator at Cooper Hewitt and Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City. Uh, and also, she's just someone that I look up to as a writer and curator. Those are two things that I'm still always learning. And uh, some of the best things I've learned have come from her books and her work. Uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to check out the Bauhaus book that we published, the catalog for that goes along with Bauhaus at 100, um, please do. Her introduction is really an important part of that book and really sets the stage for what we tried to do with that show. So, so excited to welcome Ellen to the stage and really excited about this, uh, this kind of collaborative event with Cooper Hewitt. Thanks for joining us, Ellen. Thanks, Stephen. I learned so much from you too. It's amazing. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. Um, greetings from Cooper Hewitt. Um, I'm Ellen Lupton. I'm curator of contemporary design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. And we are really delighted to be doing this program with you at the Letter Form Archive. In the service of accessibility, I'm going to describe myself. I'm a white woman with dark blonde hair. I'm wearing a dark t-shirt and a modern pearl necklace designed by Betty Cook. <laughs> and behind me are two of my favorite places in the world, the Letterform Archive and Cooper Hewitt Museum. And both galleries are overflowing with Bauhaus, and that makes me super happy. I'm a Bauhaus fangirl, and I'm so delighted to be able to nerd out about all things Bauhaus tonight with you. On behalf of Cooper Hewitt, this program is presented by the Parsons School of Design Cooper Hewitt MA program in the History of Design and Curatorial Studies. Our lecture series, Graphic Design History, is part of our spring graduate seminar, which I'm teaching every week with a wonderful group of grad students 
and some of our events are public, including tonight's talk. Um, so welcome grad students. It's so great to have you here in the audience. Our lecture series was created by the curators at Cooper Hewitt to celebrate the work of our community of, of scholars and curators. So in 2019, Cooper Hewitt opened our exhibition, Herbert Beyer Bauhaus Master, which features pieces from our collection and from the amazing collection of Meryl C. Berman. Alas, the pandemic forced us to close our exhibition short. Uh, we didn't get to share it as much as we had hoped to. At the Letterform Archive, you have a few more weeks to come and see the amazing exhibition Bauhaus Typography at 100. And if you can't see it in person, please check out the amazing book that Stephen just mentioned. So full of new things and new photography of our favorite stuff up close and personal. And Cooper Hewitt also published a book um, about Herbert Beyer featuring a lot of pieces from our collection and Meryl Berman's collection. So there are so many ways to enjoy the Bauhaus <laughs> and tonight is gonna be one of them. Um, it was a life altering experience for me to be able to walk through this exhibition live and in person with Rob Saunders, who curated the show and is director of the Letterform Archive. And he spent hours with me um, going through the extraordinary pieces that he assembled for this show. And so we're gonna go on a quick little run through. There is early Bauhaus, there's high Bauhaus, there's some pre-Bauhaus, and there's Bauhaus influencers. And one of my favorite pieces in the exhibition is this weird little book cover by a German designer named Walter Dexel. Um, and he, he's representing the human body here the parts of the body with just lines and circles. Uh, and that's a theme we can kind of follow tonight is some of this anatomy of the Bauhaus body um, and sort of explore <laughs> a, a rather strange and, and reduced sense of, of what the human form can be. Um, it kind of works, you know? Now, Walter Dexel himself had rather mixed opinions of the Bauhaus and he was working at the same time and creating quite similar work to what people were doing at the Bauhaus. And it, it was rather annoying to him. And he thought the Bauhaus was quite overrated and dependent on a never failing flow of publicity. <laughs> and that my friends is exactly the point. The Bauhaus people knew from very early on that they needed graphic design and lots of it in order to get the word out and keep people interested in this little art school that was always struggling to stay open. Uh, and graphic design was there as a subject matter and a medium, but also simply as a tool for survival. The exhibition also has a section called Beyond the Bauhaus that shows us what people did after they left, like the radical pedagogy of Max Bill or the influence of the Bauhaus on corporate modernism and corporate identity standards. Uh, but it doesn't end on a corporate note. Um, one of my favorite pieces in the exhibition is this extraordinary poster by Vanessa Zuniga Tanitsere, who's a designer from Colombia. And she studies the graphic language of pre-Columbian pottery and analyzes it to uncover and present the modular language of representation found in those pieces. Um, and so beautiful and imaginative abstractions of human forms and animal forms and abstract decorative forms. And then that study of these indigenous design languages 
and forms her own invention of her own language for her time and place. So let's dive in to the Bauhaus and start at the beginning. Once upon a time in Weimar, Germany, a little art school opened. And the first director of the Bauhaus was the architect Walter Gropius. And by the time he left in 1928, just really a short time later, it was the most famous art school in the world. And in his opening statements about creating the school, he spoke of the devastation in his country and across Europe wrought by World War I. He said, the ruined world, visible and invisible, will be resuscitated from our brains and from our hands. And it is with that kind of grand statement of utopian possibility that he started a school of art and design in Weimar. And the school has left us many things, many legacies. And one is its idea of a basic course, a preliminary experience for incoming students that plunges everybody into a direct engagement with materials and form with the goal of erasing all the bad habits and all the received ideas that young artists might have brought with them to the school. And this idea remains in use in schools around the world. And here we see Gropius's very famous diagram translated into English of the Bauhaus curriculum with that basic course at the edge. I was really interested recently to find this more casual drawing by Paul Clay, who taught in the basic course at the Bauhaus, that takes that same content and, and renders it in a kind of different hand. And there at the top of the circle, two little flags have been planted. And one of them seems to say something like propaganda. And the other says verlag or publishing. <laughs> and so there at the edges, in the outskirts, in the suburbs of the Bauhaus mind was graphic design and publicity making its little stake, right? Um, and offering perhaps a lifeline to the school. <laughs> Uh, the first leader of the basic course was Johannes Itten. He was a painter, um, a Swiss painter. He wore long robes and he studied an esoteric philosophy called Mazdazan. Um, and he had many followers who actually came with him to the Bauhaus who already um, embraced his teachings, which were very much based in expressionism and spirituality and principles of uh, vegetarianism and celibacy. And the work that his students did there in his classroom was very wild and physical and raw. It may not be what many people associate with the Bauhaus when they think of sort of clean and perfect geometries. Um, a beautiful project that it initiated and worked on is this portfolio of prints called Utopia, Documents of Reality. Uh, and the cover is designed by Margit Terry Adler, who was a student of Itten. And it's full of these extraordinary lithographic um, type studies or lettering studies by Itten that are directly based on the teaching that he was doing in his basic course, where he would have students contemplate an image of an old master painting or a medieval painting and attempt to chart their inner emotional response to the work. And he got very angry if people didn't look really into it and really appropriately distressed by the emotional content, a sort of reverse trigger warning in the early Bauhaus. And in this beautiful um, drawing here, we see he's created this esoteric geometric diagram on top of the typography and that also flips over and lays on top of the image. Um, and it's, it's another theme that we'll see in Bauhaus graphic design, these kind of networks of lines 
that make visible um, invisible energies, life forces, um, ideas, thoughts, we could call them thought lines or theory lines. And it's something that we'll see many of the artists and designers at the school create, regardless of their particular ideological <laughs> outlook. Um, one of Itten's outstanding students was a young woman named Friedel Dicker, uh, who followed Itten to the Bauhaus and worked with him in his classroom and created works like this extraordinary watercolor in which she's exploring letter forms, not unlike those we saw in Itten's portfolio. And Dicker also studied with Kandinsky and Clay who were teaching in the basic course as well. And she was the first student to be invited to help teach that course. So she very early on took a leadership role and a pedagogical role at the school. Um, in addition to being a student. And here we see some postcards designed by Kandinsky and Clay for the first Bauhaus exhibition in 1923, where they're translating their drawings into kind of graphic advertisements for the energy and ideas of the Bauhaus. And we can see some of those energy lines at work um, in, in their uh, graphics as well. Dicker collaborated with Itten on the Utopia portfolio, which included not only those lithographic hand-drawn letters by Itten, but this extraordinary series of letterpress prints where Dicker worked with a printer to translate Itten's texts into letterpress, a process that she spent several weeks on. It was very rigorous, ongoing work. She wrote letters about it uh, to her friend about the process of creating this typography for Itten. And we can come in and see the extraordinary typography, uh, the use of much more decorative typefaces than you might associate with the Bauhaus and attempting to translate some of that energy and angst from Itten's hand, handmade letters into something distinctly typographic. And it's, it's quite wonderful that a page proof exists from one of these prints where we can see Dicker and or Itten writing sketches and notes to the printer. And the printer would then go and make those corrections, which are reflected as you see in the final print. Um, so it's really fun when we get to get little scraps of the working process of our favorite designers. These, these traces of the real, these traces of the thought process. After the Bauhaus, Dicker worked as a designer, artist, and teacher. Between 1943 and 1944, she taught art to children in the Theresienstadt concentration camp ghetto. Dicker herself was murdered in Auschwitz, Poland in 1944. Several of her students survived and became founders of the new discipline of art therapy and child psychology. So if we think about the legacy of Bauhaus teaching and Bauhaus pedagogy, this is one beautiful vein of this idea of art as experience and art as access to inner knowledge that carries forward today and has survived in this most extraordinary manner, um, the worst experiences of human history. Dicker was able to save over 4,000 of the drawings created by these children, and they are preserved today in the Jewish Museum in Prague, Czech Republic. Um, and you can see here the influence of Clay and Kandinsky and Itten and Dicker herself carried forth into these extraordinary works. It's kind of heavy, so I just want to take a moment for us all to think about that, especially in this time of war that we're currently experiencing. Um,
spirit Bauhaus. That's the thing. I think we all just experienced some of it together. The spirit of the place carrying forward. And those early years at the Bauhaus were very much um, in, in embedded in an expressionist point of view. They were very interested in the other worldly. Lothar Schreier was an avant-garde theater director. His work celebrated sound and movement and gesture over the traditional focus on literature in the theater. His 1921 play, Crucifixion, is documented in this woodcut book, which is in the exhibition and in the collection at the Letterform Archive, and which I had only ever seen little black and white images of it in various Bauhaus publications. And it's so extraordinary to be able to encounter it up close and to see the real thing and how big and rich and material it is. Schreier was director of the stage workshop at the Bauhaus in Weimar from 1921 to 1923, those early years, those spirit years. And here is our, our theme of, of weird anatomies at the Bauhaus. These are some representations of the players on the stage and how they might have been dressed in a very abstracted way. This one is called Mutter or Mother. <laughs> And the mother here is a bunch of rectangles with circles for her eyes, her face, her mouth, her breasts, her womb, um, quite an abstracted image of the maternal. And inside the book, perhaps its most um, extraordinary element or influential element is this visual score that Schreier created that was an attempt to translate the sounds words, movements, and tones of the theatrical performance into a kind of score based on the linear layers of a musical score. And it's quite obscure. Um, he knew that most people would not be able to really recreate any kind of performance for it. And he saw it as something much more esoteric that would um, reach those with the special talent uh, to understand what it was about. Schreier was forced to leave the Bauhaus in 1923 as Gropius craved a new direction for the school. And he was replaced by Oscar Schlemmer as director of the theater workshop, who ushered in a new period of Bauhaus experimentation with bodies and space. Um, and, and here we see a diagram of a, of a player on a stage enveloped by a network of these thought lines or theory lines, um, piercing the body, turning the stage into a kind of space thickened by geometry. So we're into constructivist Bauhaus, a different time, a different place. Um, Itten was also forced to resign in 1923. Gropius was fed up with the eccentricity. Um, it was not a good luck for the people of Weimar, a quite conservative town. Um, and, and Gropius was committed to moving the school in a, a new direction, more towards technology and industry. Um, and he hired someone to replace Itten, a young artist named Laszlo Moholinaj, who was Hungarian. He was only 28 years old when he started working at the Bauhaus. And he often um, was mistaken for a student because he was so youthful. Um, and, and the other faculty, Clay, and Kandinsky um, and Muka, other people who were teaching at the time are really a different generation from Moholinaj. So Moholinaj arrives as this young blood full of en energy, um, an immigrant who didn't speak German clearly um, and full of a passion to really live out and create the vision 
um, imagined by Walter Gropius. And so they quickly became very close collaborators. And Maholi Naj was really um, licensed to like, <laughs> to do it, to make it happen, to make this new Bauhaus happen. And this portrait, he is by his wife, Lucia Maholi. Um, he's shown wearing a engineer's coverall over his suit and tie, his shirt and tie. So he's really representing a very new image of the artist who is not, um, not wearing long flowing robes like Itten, uh, but is dressed as a kind of worker of the future, an, an intellectual worker of the future. He had already an established career before coming to the Bauhaus. Um, as he traveled across Eastern Germany to Berlin in 1920, he earned money for his train tickets by doing lettering and sign painting. <laughs> so there is this survival instinct with graphic design. On his way to Berlin, he contracted the Spanish flu and nearly died, survived that pandemic. Um, and he belonged to the Hungarian avant-garde group Ma, which means today, and continued throughout um, the magazine's publication to be the Berlin correspondent um, for the journal. Lucia Moholy Naj, his wife, was a photographer and writer. And before meeting Laszlo in 1920, she was working in the publishing industry and quite a bit of knowledge of how books and magazines are published. And she was also a photographer and began studying commercial photography while at the Bauhaus. And if you were ever curious what their apartment looked like, well, here you are in the actual dining room of Lucia and Laszlo fitted out with Bauhaus furniture and Bauhaus artwork. Lucia Maholi's photographs of people and objects and Bauhaus buildings became part of the visual bedrock of the Bauhaus myth, both during the time the school was opened and after the school closed. Um, in this, uh, these pages from the Bauhaus Journal, she is credited for her photography, but that would end later. And Walter Gropius took her negatives with him when he emigrated to the United States and really used these glass negatives that she had created um, to help build the and spread the myth of the Bauhaus in the US and kind of cut her out of that process, something that she fought hard against um, for, for decades to come. Maholi Naj and Herbert Beyer designed um, this catalog for the big 1923 exhibition in Weimar, which is sort of a last stand event to prove the value of the school. And this beautiful book, which is available in a, in a gorgeous facsimile that came out in 2019, um, really gets you inside the mind of the school at that moment. The cover is designed by Herbert Beyer. The interior pages are designed by Maholi Naj, um, who worked with Gropius to make the book happen, to, um, uh, to edit the book as well as lay it out. So when we talk about designing a book, it isn't just someone being handed some files, but, but really the whole conception of, of how it could happen. The book is square, which reflected the philosophy of geometry that was being espoused by Kandinsky at that moment. Um, and that was part of this kind of creation of a visible scientific image for the school, the yellow triangle, the red square, the blue circle, a kind of elementary sentence of, um, of visual geometry. Um, a square book is hard to design. We can see Maholi Naj kind of struggling there with it, with these very long lines. <laughs> but here he is launching the new typography 
Uh, and this is considered the first essay to use that phrase. And it would go on to have a, a huge influence on typography in the 1920s. Um, and I see Hans has his hand raised. I'm not sure if Stephen could maybe help him. Um, so there's the new typography getting started. Gropius and Maholinaj also decided to um, publish an entire series of books, the Bauhaus book series, which are beautiful little slim volumes. They were not meant to be big or imposing or expensive. They were written by leading artists and designers of the day. They were the voice of the avant-garde written by people both at the Bauhaus and across Europe. And Maholi Naj designed these books, often with the assistance of Lucia Maholi. Together, they wrote Bauhaus book number eight, painting, photography, film, although Lucia is not credited for the book. And the cover features an abstract photogram, which is a technique that Lucia and Maholi developed together in her dark room at the Bauhaus. And here's another beautiful printer's proof. <laughs> this is from painting photography film. Um, and we can see here where Maholi Naj has told the printer that he wants these black bars to run off the edges of the page, to bleed, to be more dynamic. And he's adding an arrow to create more sense of motion to the page. And that's how it got printed. <laughs> so again, I just, I just love seeing that process taking place um, and imagining this, this young artist figuring it out and uh, kind of learning on the job how to create the new typography, something he had written about, but didn't quite get what it would be, um, and then really making it happen. In essays like this, in painting, photography, film, he's creating a score for a movie. So the idea of how to use typography and grid lines and photographs and repetition and symbols to create a visual translation of the action and unfolding of a, of a film. And we can see the influence of Maholi Naj here in this beautiful book, which is featured in the exhibition at the Letter Forum Archive. The author Takao Itagaki visited Europe in the 20s and is, is very directly creating an homage here to Maholi Naj in this gorgeous book cover. Maholi Naj also looked at the idea of graphic notation in Bauhaus book four, the theater of the Bauhaus, which he co-authored with Oscar Schlemmer and Farkas Molnar. The cover here is by Schlemmer. And inside the book is this incredible piece of information design that folds out of the book and is a score for performing on stage. And Maholi Naj was deeply interested in theater and performance and created many designs related to theatrical space and how it could envelop the audience and engage the audience and use new, new technologies of light and projection and stage design. So here we are at the top of this long graphic and we can see Maholi Naj's diagram of the stage, which includes uh, moving panels. It includes a screen for projecting films and light on, um, a lower visible stage for musical instruments and sound making of all kind. And underneath are these vertical bands showing the um, simultaneous uh, creation of, of form and light and music and movement. And we can travel through the piece and see this uh, beautiful diagrammatic um, design uh, that, for example, the color bars are showing 
different intensities of light and simultaneity of light. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite an interesting and elaborate system. And of course, we saw it earlier, a similar interest in the more expressionistic woodcut work of Lothar Schreier. Um, so sometimes, you know, art historians and theater people say, well, these things are interesting experiments, but did they really um, work? You know, aren't they just too obscure for someone really to make sense of? Um, and there's some truth to that. But really, if we think about time-based media from a distance perspective from today, there are incredible parallels in the software we use in the interfaces for animation or video editing, which use these timelines and layers to, um, to help the creator work out camera movements and transitions and timing and sound all in simultaneous form. So I think the Bauhaus is always there inventing something and perhaps it's real use changes over time. Um, but there it is, that extraordinary uh, work. One of Maholi Naj's students was Mariana Brandt, um, a German artist who came to the Bauhaus. She abandoned a career as an expressionist painter. It said that she burned all her paintings to start over and immerse herself in this new experience at the school. And she entered Maholi Naj's metal workshop and she was the only woman in that workshop and quickly became one of the most influential product designers of the Bauhaus, creating many of the school's um, most memorable and iconic objects. Um, she ultimately became acting director when Maholi Naj left in 1928. And this self-portrait we see her holding a camera up to a mirror to take an image of herself. And these are some of the incredible products that she made in the metal workshop. Um, her teapot from 1924 is one of her first products and was created in, in Weimar. And it shows um, the her fascination with these perfect geometries, which we've seen throughout the course of the school, whether it was expressionist wombs and screaming faces of the mother or a more rational geometry in the pedagogy of Kandinsky. Um, and so here we see this, this teapot turned into half of a globe um, and an ebony circle as the handle and a cross as the base. Um, later, her work would become more functional, less of a less founded in, in craft and, and sculpture and, and more in the function within the home. So her hanging glass lamps were designed um, so that it would be easy for someone to adjust the height of the lamp as it hangs over, say, the dining room table or, or work area. And these lamps are still in production. They, they really work for people. The teapot's not in production, but is one of the world's most coveted objects <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so beautiful. Mariana Brandt also created photo montages. And, and most of these were done in, in a short period where she took a leave from the Bauhaus and, and did some traveling. And the photo montages uh, for many Bauhaus designers and artists and, and many artists of the era were kind of an outlet for personal expression. Uh, and they were cheap because uh, you could make photo montages by just cutting out magazines that you happen to have around. <laughs> so we can imagine Mariana Brandt um, with her favorite magazines, creating images of what it was like to live at that time. So the image on the left shows a kind of liberated Bauhaus body, you know, a body in space wearing, you know, minimal clothing to, to exercise and have freedom of movement. 
But then on the right is another kind of reality where we have a woman kneeling um, and, and these lines of thought or these theory lines uh, connecting her hands to a sort of bourgeois man in a, in a hat and a suit um, who's really controlling society and, and controlling her destiny. Um, so we get two, two very different interpretations of, of, of life in the 1920s for her. This is sort of a fun one. This is a design she did for a journal cover in 1927 that was intended for reproduction. I, I don't think it was ever reproduced, but that was its intention. And here we see this kind of joyous engineering figure, this guy in a, in a jumpsuit uh, manipulating the, the lever of a giant machine. And that machine seems to be cranking out typography as all machines uh, should. Um, and I think she's done a really nice job at, at creating this, um, this sense of joy and, and motion. And if you were ever curious about Mariana Brandt's work from home setup, well, here you have it. <laughs> there she is catching some sunlight on her Bauhaus balcony, reading the latest issue of Bauhaus magazine. And then there's practical Bauhaus. So I want to tell you about one of my favorite Bauhaus people who was Herbert Beyer. <laughs> and Herbert Beyer came to the Bauhaus as a student in 1921. Um, he was very young, he was 21 years old. He didn't have a lot of background in art. He'd done some, some studies, but he was pretty green to it. And he had this copy of Kandinsky's book concerning this ritual in art. And there's a similar copy in the exhibition at Letterform Archive. And I like to imagine in my fantasy that that's Herbert's copy of the Kandinsky book. And he was so taken with this little book um, that he was compelled to go and enroll in the Bauhaus. He couldn't afford a train ticket, so he walked 258 kilometers from Darmstadt to Weimar. According to Google Maps, that's a 54 hour hike. I hope he had some cookies. And in those early years at Weimar, there was no graphic design workshop. There was no formal um, training in graphic design. Um, but Gropius recognized that Bayer was interested in graphic design and encouraged him to do this work. Um, and he knew it would be good for the school too, <laughs> that the school needed uh, some publicity. Uh, so this postcard for the 1923 exhibition uh, shows, uses those kind of theory lines, the thought lines in a very practical way. Basically, this little postcard is a geometry lesson in how to draw a circle, a square, and a triangle. Um, so it's very functional and very direct. <laughs> um, everything in this postcard is drawn by hand. Uh, the Bauhaus did not have any typesetting equipment at the Weimar. The print shop there was really intended for artistic printing and not for commercial printing. And it's fun to come in close to this original maquette from Merrill Berman's collection, where we can see Bayer working it out in gouache and creating this design for a postcard. In 1925, the Bauhaus moved to Dessau, um, a, a city near Berlin, in a brand new campus designed by Walter Gropius with architectural lettering by Herbert Beyer. And Beyer returned to the school now as a young master, no longer a student. And he set up a modern letterpress print shop 
at the Bauhaus for printing publications and documents and ads and postcards. And students worked with him. Um, he was a very practical guy. He was not much interested in doing theoretical lectures. And he preferred to simply be working there in the shop with students rather than uh, devising elaborate exercises and experiences for them. And this is a, a portrait by his wife, Irene Beyer from 1926, where he's marking up some proofs. Um, among the many things printed there in that letterpress workshop were letterheads. Uh, Herbert Beyer was interested in contemporary theories <clears throat> at the time and what business correspondence should look like. Um, and so he used the letterhead as a testing ground for new ideas in design. So he's distributed the text across the field of the letterhead, creating a kind of typographic grid and creating spaces for a typist to add their content to the letterhead. And across the bottom of the letterhead is a manifesto about why capital letters should be banished from writing. Um, he felt that capital letters were um, unnecessary. They were not functional because we don't hear them in speech. They were a waste of metal. They made fonts too big and too difficult to produce. Um, and they were kind of um, hierarchical, lowercase letters and, and printing in, entirely in lowercase was a more egalitarian kind of typography. This was not an uncommon belief in the 20s. Various progressive designers were interested in this abolishing of capital letters, but Herbert Beyer hung on to it for way longer than most people did. For many decades, he continued to espouse that this is what societies should do. Now, it is very, very exciting to Bauhaus fangirls and fan people all around the world that the Letterform Archive has acquired Herbert Byers' original actual drawing for his universal alphabet of 1926. How cool is that? <laughs> Amazing. So of course the alphabet is only lowercase because, right? Um, and it is an alphabet designed on modular principles using parts of circles and straight lines. So abandoning the organic complexity of traditional fonts for this very purified geometry. And it's so fun to come in close and see the little guidelines that he used to create the letter forms, the anchor points for the compass, the mistakes, the retouching, the perfecting of those circles. Whoops. Sorry about that. Um, the overlapping arcs, right? I love to see a font that actually preserved all that element of making in, in Herbert Beyer's letter forms, so cool. Herbert Beyer eventually emigrated to the United States um, and this remarkable photo montage is in the collection of Cooper Hewitt Museum. We have over 500 works by Beyer, mostly from his career in the US. Um, and so we're so proud to have this material and to be able to study it and share it. Here we see a giant ham flying through the sky, escorted by warplanes. Um, and Bayer has added those theory lines or thought lines to the trajectory of the plane to kind of dramatize the space and the action going on here. Um, why is the ham? flying through the air. Well, it turns out that this montage was created for an ad for gas stoves. And the, the gas industry in the US was fighting 
the electric stove industry. <laughs> and they use this kind of wartime depiction of the ham to suggest that, that cooking with gas was more patriotic. This is 1942. Um, and there's Bayer standing in one of his exhibition designs with his theory lines turned into physical objects. He's been able to make it real, to put those lines into space. He was part of a wave of European emigres who promoted modernist design in the US. And throughout his long career in the US, he never stopped talking about the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus was his point of origin, a calling card, a magical word um, that brought all kinds of intrigue and respect uh, to the work that he was doing um, in his remaining career. And this is one of my favorite Herbert Beyer pieces uh, created in 1939 in the US and it shows a uterus beautifully rendered in pinks and red and black and gray, surrounded by the menstrual cycle and the phases of the moon and emanating from the center are those thought lines or theory lines bringing us you know, to the core of human generation. Um, extraordinary uh, piece. And, and the brochure is actually about five inches tall. It's a very tiny little piece that he made this extraordinary image for. And it was um, used to promote a hormone-based pharmaceutical pro product uh, to doctors. Um, so there's the Bauhaus, the Bauhaus at the center of everything. Um, this extraordinary diagram of the Bauhaus in Dessau depicts the school um, in relation to how far it is from other cities in Germany and France and, and beyond. So this notion of the Bauhaus being in the middle and projecting outward, selling itself, promoting itself, sending out its products, its postcards, its books, and making itself heard uh, through often graphic design. And the curriculum with its center in architecture, but its periphery in basic design, creating this system of pedagogy that was adopted all around the world and is still with us. Bauhaus bodies, look at this extraordinary drawing by Kandinsky from his book, Point and Line to Plane, a Bauhaus book, um, showing this ecstatic, circular, concentric body kind of exploding into space. Um, Bauhaus business, it was always a business. The school was always trying to stay afloat. It never had enough money. This gorgeous logo by Maholi Naj was designed to advertise and brand that Bauhaus book series, which was part of the school's financial plan. <laughs> and that idea of business, it carries on. Um, this beautiful logo by Paul Rand, who loved the Bauhaus and took those ideas in his own direction or Tom Geismar's identity for uh, mobile oil company, also on view in the exhibition at the Letter Forum archive. And then finally, this incredible icon uh, found by Vanessa Zuniga to Nitsere in the pre-Columbian pottery of indigenous people in Colombia and finding the Bauhaus everywhere, um, taking it back, finding that geometry wasn't invented in the 20s. It's bigger than all of us. It's forever, it's infinite. Um, every generation discovers and destroys the Bauhaus for itself. The Bauhaus always had enemies. 
there are always people that wanted to shut it down. Ultimately, the Nazis did in 1933. Um, when Laszlo Maholy Naj left in 1928, um, he said, ah, I want to get out of here. It's just gotten too commercial. It's too focused on utilitarian stuff. Um, and leaving with him the same year were Marcel Breuer and Walter Gropius and Zanti Shavinsky. And they all went to Berlin to be commercial designers, <laughs> right? Enough, enough of art school. Let's make some stuff out there in the world. Um, so the Bauhaus, we keep finding it. We keep finding new things there. Um, I keep loving it. I keep, um, I keep seeing new ways to understand it uh, and, and new people who were forgotten or erased or overlooked um, who were making things and making it happen. So, um, so thank you. I enjoyed talking with you all about the Bauhaus and perhaps we can have a conversation. Thank you so much, Ellen. That was fantastic. You are such an excellent storyteller. And I've already, I mean, I thought I, well, never thought I knew at all about the Bauhaus, but there were a ton of things in there that were new to me. So thank you so, so much for that. Really beautifully organized too. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions and probably won't get to them all, but I'll, I'll start picking out a few and I'll just do one now that uh, just because it was, uh, you were just talking about theory lines. Craig Eliason asked, uh, what was the source for that term? Uh, I've seen similar forms referred to as lines of force in the context of futurist art, a label with a very different connotation oh. for a very similar visual element. Yeah, I don't have an official word for it. Um, I came up with theory lines. Um, my friend Jenny Tobias and I have been bouncing like, what do you call this thing? that recurs through so much Bauhaus design and yet is used sometimes in a very mystical way, uh, sometimes in a decorative way, sometimes in a functional way. It's actually how something was made. Um, but what they do is they visualize the invisible, right? So lines of force is, is good too. And, um, you know, in American streamlining, speed whiskers, right, were used to show objects moving and, and were much maligned by the good modernists because toasters don't actually move. Why do they need speed whiskers? So this, this idea of trying to add a sense of, of movement, but also I think of, of spirit or intellect to things like that these thin pencil lines, they, um, they create relationships, they connect this to that. And so you see them in you know, the paintings of Maholy Naj, as well as his graphic design in Kandinsky, of course, yes, in Futurism, and in, in, in lots of the artwork of, of the period. And I don't think there's any single point of origin. It's like a thing, a technique. Um, that gets used and well, takes I on all different meanings. I, I like coining our own terms whenever, whenever <laughs> we can, whenever we need to, to help explain things. And so I think that's an excellent one. Um, just to answer a common question that's coming up uh, often in the chat, that we will send the uh, transcript of the chat to everyone after the event, as well as a recording. So don't worry, you won't, you won't miss out on that if you had to come and go. Uh, a question from an anonymous attendee. What are some common misconceptions people have about the Bauhaus? Well, I mean, the, the main one is that the Bauhaus is rational. And I know in my own writing, I've said, oh, the rational period. I don't think the Bauhaus was very rational. <laughs> you know, the Bauhaus was grandiose. It was theoretical. It was um, utopian. And so there's the, that expressionist period, the very spiritual period, which gets a bit buried and overshadowed and, and was deliberately buried by Gropius, who became 
the um, the spokesman for the Bauhaus in its afterlife, right? The main spokesman. So that area, that that period, gets kind of brushed under the carpet and hidden away. And yet, it it's so much part of the school. And if you read the writings of of Maholi Naj and and others who are associated with the so-called rational Bauhaus, it's some pretty wild stuff, you know, about remaking man and this kind of reinventing the biology of human existence through design. <laughs> it's not just rational. It's it's more than that. And I, and think, I think sometimes people uh, confuse the rational typography or what they see as rational typography with the, with all of the uh, uh, the ways that they were actually thinking, but that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. Uh, here's a question from Hans Koch. Uh, what were the inspirational and personal connections between Bauhaus designers and the Russian constructivists? Thank you for the wonderfully in, in, uh, informative lecture. Well, Ella Zizky traveled uh, and lived in Germany during the early 1920s. Um, and so he knew many of the Bauhaus people and, and, they, and they knew him. So there was a direct link there. Um, Malevich, who was Ukrainian, um, was hugely influential to the, obviously the founding of constructivism, but also to abstract art in Western Europe. And one of the Bauhaus books was a book by Malevich. Um, so there's a lot of influence there. But I think it's really important that there is also an avant-garde in Poland and an avant-garde in Hungary and other Eastern Euro European countries. And that part of the decolonization of the Bauhaus and the decolonization of modernism is really about looking at parts of Europe that kind of get squished between Germany and Russia. <laughs> right? There's sort of a hegemony of that constructivism is Russian and you know, new typography is German. Uh, but there are so many people working in um, other parts of, of Europe and creating constructivist design and socialist inspired design. And, you know, I've been looking a lot just this week at Maholi Naj's career before the Bauhaus. So I, I had just had in my mind that, you know, Maholi Naj was so young and he had this opportunity to teach at the Bauhaus and that created him. But he actually had quite an interesting and extensive practice before he got to the Bauhaus, which frankly is why he got the job. <laughs> and that some of those ideas like creating scores for a film, um, that entire project he had already designed in, in Berlin, in Hungarian um, in 1922. And you know, those ideas are, are, are there before the Bauhaus. That's amazing. I mean, how young was he? That, that was that was early. Well, he was 28 when he came to the Bauhaus. Oh, right. Okay. So he's not as young as Herbert Beyer, right. who was right. really green. Herbert Beyer arrives really as just a kid. You know, he was 21 and, um, you know, did not have his own voice as an artist. But Maholi Naj, man, <laughs> he came there with a voice. Mm -hmm. And with knowledge, you know, Gropius didn't know what to do about constructivism. Maholi Naj brought that to the quick, school. Uh, a quick question from Kevin Woodland that it, it asked if, if Maholi Naj coined the term, the new typography in that document you showed, uh, was that before anyone else? Uh, Chickhold, of course, is famous for using it, but. Well, Chickhold, uh, Chickhold did not coin the term. Chickhold visited the Bauhaus exhibition and bought that book in 1923. Um, Maholi Naj was a very close friend in Berlin with Kurt Schwitters, who we all know as a Dada, you know, artist, but was also a graphic designer and, and very interested in typography and functional typography. And Maholi Naj really got his typography bug from Schwitters and was super interested in what Schwitters was, was doing. Uh, uh, Caroline, uh, Caroline or Caroline Hatch asks, um, 
it's interesting how much propaganda goes into the argument for the necessity of the school. We are at a time period now when so many pure art schools are suffering or closing or shifting focus to more marketable art programs like graphic design or design MBAs. What do you think current art schools could take from the Bauhaus? Well, you know, that communicating what you do matters that you know that a school isn't just what happens between faculty and students but the schools create knowledge and that that knowledge can be shared and can can emanate and um, can can go further um, I mean, graphic design at the Bauhaus was not the most highly valued discipline, right? <laughs> Far from it. It wasn't even in the curriculum at Weimar. Architecture was the most highly valued discipline, but graphic design was there out of necessity. And I think part of the impulse to create that working print shop in Dessau was knowing that they needed to print their own stuff, you know? <laughs> So, you know, I love that about graphic design, that it's necessary, that we need it to communicate, that we need it to explain who we are. And fine artists need it just as much as graphic designers do. We all need to communicate what we do. Beautiful, thank you. Beppe Owen, uh asks if you could share your thoughts on the Bauhaus's overlap uh, or distinctions from the arts and crafts movement, or more specifically uh, for book design, the German private press movement, Bremer, Krenna, et cetera. Is it fair to say the spirit of the Bauhaus the school looks forward into modernity while arts and crafts looks backwards? Um, and I appreciate well, any insight you have <laughs> on these two movements. Well, there are whole books written on that. It's a huge topic and the Bauhaus definitely came out of those reform movements, um, the reform of industry and, and so forth that art, arts and crafts represents. Um, so the German Werkbund, for example, is you know a direct in a direct line with the Bauhaus. I, I don't want to speak in a scholarly way about it because there's just so much that's been written on that. But they are connected, not not disconnected. They're much more connected than they are separate. Uh, Susan Mantis asks, were they designing all non-serif typefaces? We actually post an article on our uh, blog yes. about the, uh, <laughs> the letter forms design. You know, most of the experiments in alphabets at the Bauhaus were, were just alphabets. They weren't uh, actually made into typefaces. Uh, but there was one typeface that the that, uh, buyer designed that was a serif. Um, any other answer to that question? You're the expert on that, Stephen. I think your forensics on Bauhaus typography are <laughs> legendary. <Forensics. laughs> you know? Right down to the fonts used by Itten and Friedel Dicker in their Utopia book. You know, that's pretty cool. I know you have a good library. Um, yeah, I would, can, but that you've makes got it the eye easier. to find <laughs> that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's just, uh, it's often a misconception that they were designing typefaces there. They were really experimenting with letter forms, uh, but the, the typefaces that were used were the ones that were already in existence and they just did amazing things with them uh, for the most part. Uh, but they also used their lettering in, in things and you could consider those typefaces in a way. Uh, Kevin Woodland asks, hi Ellen, did the designers of the Swiss typography movement favor all lowercase settings for the same reasons that uh, as buyer, or is it for different reasons? Was buyer really speaking for all the Bauhaus in that, in that essay? Well, first of all, buyer did not invent this movement. Um, you know, he was one of, of many who espoused getting rid of capital letters. And there's a, actually a management theory guy named, I think, Portsmann, who really originated the, the notion of it. But yes, the Swiss designers um, also embrace the idea of lowercase letters as being more egalitarian and also more organic, which was very important to Max Bill, that typography be organic. And so those um, shapes were very desirable. And so, yes, the, the um, the egalitarian quality of, of lowercase letters 
I think was much better exploited by the Swiss designers later than, than they did at the Bauhaus. Uh, Niels Torsen asks, can you touch on the balance of the Bauhaus idea of reducing things to their simplest form versus use of element in graphic design? Well, I think I think the idea of um, of reducing form is just one of the fundamental design principles explored at the Bauhaus, and I think it's important to acknowledge that people for all millennia have reduced form <laughs> to geometry. Right, this is not owned by the Bauhaus; it was articulated by the Bauhaus. Um, but it is an incredible design principle and one that has to be learned, right? I think we have a impulse to make things more complex. And so that finding of the essence and removing what's extraneous is a, is a learning, you know, whether you're a writer and learning to make a better sentence or a designer creating a layout, um, it's it's a learning. And that kind of goes along with this. Monica already asked, how can we take these some of these Bauhaus principles to modern UX design? Hi, Monica. <laughs> well, I mean, it's the same idea of laying a field. I mean, that letterhead that Bayer did where the type is like points in a field, you know, like creating spaces for activity to happen. That's an interface idea. Maholi Naj's score for a theatrical performance is an interface idea. Um, and so I, I just think that so much of what we see in these kind of mythical legendary works continue to inform what we do today and continue to have value as long as we don't see them as some kind of law that can't be broken, right? I think there's a history of the Bauhaus being seen as oppressive and creating a set of, of rules that are imposed on, on people and, and that's to be avoided. Yeah, I think that one of the things I learned most in, in just experiencing this, uh, I wasn't part of the curation process, but just experiencing the exhibition and, and looking at the buyer exhibition is just how it was about experimentation more than rules, that it was, uh, there was all sorts of different <laughs> things going on and uh, not tying exactly. it down to every exactly. one philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, Yvonne, this might be too long to answer for today, but asks, can you explain the process of how hand-drawn letters are transformed into something that can be used for printing? That I mean, might be there, more there, one that you would answer. Yeah. There are multiple, yeah, there were multiple ways they could have done it through a, an engraving, making a plate that they would print from, or later it could have been photographically reproduced, but I, I'm not sure if they had that kind of technology yet at the Bauhaus. Sure, well, making a, a photographic plate of type was very common, a logo or a headline or something. Uh, what art and design school today most embodies the philosophy and practice of the Bauhaus? Can you comment on the institutional offspring of the Bauhaus, like Ulm, uh, which is a very important design school in Germany? Mm, that's a big one. I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like art schools have become very corporate, um, but the Bauhaus wanted to be corporate. <laughs> You know, the Bauhaus was trying to be a sustainable business. Um, do we see that kind of experimentation? I feel like a lot of art schools, including where I teach, we're focused on marketable skills and students want that and need that and are paying a lot of money and, you know, want to work in the, in the field. Often it doesn't feel like there's space to reinvent the world, you know, to create something radically new. Uh, I don't know how much time you have with this, Rhett, uh, getting up at 15 after the hour, but yeah. we have 21 more questions, so we won't get to them all. No, uh, how I'll about just we just a, do two yeah, How many? Two more, sounds good. Okay. Um, 
So Omar asks if there are any aesthetic hangovers from the Bauhaus movement, movement <laughs> that you notice regularly in design today. Oh dear. Um, I don't think so. I actually feel that people have in their mind that like Bauhaus typography was is better than it was. And when you look through like the Bauhaus books and Bauhaus posters and stuff, there's something kind of homespun about it. You know, I think Max Bill's generation really made it into something perfect, right? The Swiss design methodology is just so um, sleek and extendable and truly a system. And at the Bauhaus, the stuff is kind of raw. It's kind of messed up, you know? And I, I really love that about it, the, the imperfection and the seeking that you see in it. I think a lot of typography that we look at now and say, oh, that's so Bauhaus. It's really not. People aren't looking closely. Yeah, absolutely. That's another part of the I, you know, thing I've learned from this exhibition is just how much um, expressionism there is in this <laughs> Bauhaus work. And it wasn't necessarily, again, about you know following uh, some sort of straight line set of rules. Uh, there's so many here. I'm trying to pick like the best one we can close on. <laughs> um, <laughs> random, but, be random. Yeah, okay. Well, this is, um, you know, a, kind of uh, on topic for the moment, but uh, Hans asks, as a follow-up to the Russian constructivists, are there any interactions between Bauhaus and Rodchenko or Stepanova? Um, Rodchenko never went to the Bauhaus. He um, visited Europe once. Uh, he went to Paris in 1925 for the Art Deco exhibition and installed his workers room there. Um, Stepanova never went to Europe. Of course, their work was known. Why? Because it was published in avant-garde magazines. Um, including, you know, Ma, the Hungarian magazine. There were just so many places that you could see this work. And so although they didn't have an opportunity to directly interact with um, designers in Germany or, or the Netherlands, um, certainly their work was known, as was Tatlin, the great Ukrainian architect. His tower was never built but it was seen everywhere <laughs> because this plate, this photograph of it was reproduced over and over again in avant-garde magazines. Yeah, it's like without graphic design, you have no avant-garde. That is and a great Kathleen's point. Kathleen's tower existed, you know, there's a beautiful model of it, but most people only ever saw the picture. That is a great way to, to close this. What, where would it be without graphic design? <laughs> Nowhere. <laughs> Ellen, thank you so much for your generosity and your amazing scholarship and just making this stuff so accessible to so many people. It's, it's really, uh, we can all learn a lot from that and, and I have personally too. So thank you so much for this awesome event. It's been such a joy, such a joy. Thank you. Thank Stephen. you everyone. And remember you will get a copy of the recording uh, link sent to you and you'll be able to share that around as well as the chat. Uh, thanks to Cooper Hewitt. Thanks to uh, Menesha for helping host this and Sarah who couldn't be with us and the rest of Lawyer from Archive. Thank you again, Ellen. Thank you. It was great fun. Thanks to, to Rob and Lucy Parker and everybody who made such a beautiful book and exhibition. It's been an honor to be part of it. Yeah, go check out the book, everyone. You will enjoy it. And if you can come see us in person and see the show, we will love to, uh, to, to have you. All right. Take care. Closing her out. Take care. Thanks, Bye. Ellen.